Welcome back to UC Davis Live COVID-19. I'm Satirius Johnson. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on how people move around. Many of us have transitioned to working from home while essential workers have had to stay on the job and many people have lost their jobs entirely. Today, what are the virus's impacts on transportation and what do they mean for society? Joining me today are two UC Davis experts on mobility, economics, and transportation who have been looking at these issues. Giovanni Cercella is director of the Three Vet Revolutions Future Mobility Program and the Honda Distinguished Scholar for New Mobility Studies at the UC Davis Institute for Transportation Studies. He's also a senior research engineer at the Georgia Institute of Technology. His team has surveyed travel habits in major cities across North America, both before and during the pandemic. And Michael Springborn is an environmental economist and associate professor in the UC Davis Department of Environmental Science and Policy. Springborn and his colleagues have used anonymized mobile phone data to gauge how the pandemic has changed how people move around. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind viewers that this is a free webcast. You can watch it live and also watch it after the live broadcast on the UC Davis Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels. We are aware of others posting links saying you have to pay to watch this video, so please do not click on those links. This is a free webcast. Giovanni, Michael, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us, Soterius. Good morning. Good morning. So we are taking audience questions. If you're watching us live, just leave them in the comments section and we will work in as many as we can. So let's start with you, Giovanni. Uh, before the pandemic, you had already surveyed transportation habits of people in cities across the country last year and the year before. Just briefly, what were your goals back then? Sure. In the past two years in the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis, we've been doing quite a bit of data collection, collecting information about how people travel, and in particular, the adoption of new mobility options. So our focus on, over the past two years has been on understanding how people have been adopting new services like shared mobility, Uber, micromobility, e-scooters in cities, and how this has been affecting the use of private cars or public transportation and so on. And we've been conducting in particular studies, collecting responses from thousands of respondents in all over California, as well as in eight major metropolitan regions of the US, a little bit nationwide, so really to also control for the use of these technologies and services in different uh, geographical region, cultural uh, environment, uh, and uh, among different communities of users. Hmm, interesting, so, and then the pandemic hit this year. So what have you seen change in your surveys and what you've been finding? So this year, the pandemic has completely disrupted transportation. And we built on this previous work, uh, uh, continue to survey again the same participants for the previous few years. But we also expanded our work to uh, a total of 17 regions now in the US and Canada uh, to really understand how the pandemic is impacting uh, the, the, the life uh, and the organization of households all over the, the continent. And uh, many things are changing. Uh, not only public transportation is down, not only uh, uh, the use of a lot of different mobility services down, but really the most interesting thing is to see how the lifestyle of people are rearranging and changing. A lot of people has actually moved to live back with their parents, college students, young professionals. A lot of people have been making adjustments to their home to set up home offices. Uh, those that are lucky like us, uh, I like to call us the privileged that we can telecommute from work, uh, from home. We have been actually like setting up home offices with external screens, better Wi-Fi, bigger infrastructure, like, you know, to really set up home offices. And uh, households with children are also those that are really shocking to see the big changes they had to do uh, to really set up like, you know, uh, completely new patterns of uh, helping the children study from home, but also affecting the way their parents need to commute or not commute uh, and organizing a lot of other activities that go from simple things like shopping for groceries uh, to organizing daily activities for entertainment. So a really big impact that involves transportation, but more the activity patterns more in general of our households. Hmm. And, and initially, it seemed like if people are driving less, that's good for the environment. But as the pandemic goes on, are you concerned about some changes that might be bad for the environment, such as maybe less use of public transportation? In the short term, we've been seeing uh, benefits for the environment. Of course, the economy is down, activities were closed. And so there was a big reduction in greenhouse gas emission from all sectors, not only the industry, but also from uh, using cars, uh, flying, uh, and so on. Uh, moving forward in the future, there are several challenges. 
One of these is uh, that we are seeing already as economies uh, have been reopening around the world, first in China, then in Europe, and now in some states of the US, that uh, the recovery in car travel is much faster than the recovery in public transportation. And that is uh, uh, actually uh, understandable because people are concerned about shared modes. They are concerned about uh, uh, contracting the virus on a bus or on the, on the subway. But that's actually it's a very concerning thing for the environment because moving forward for the future, we might have even more car dependence. Have you any, any sense of uh, public transit agencies, what their reaction is, how they're responding to this to help encourage the use of public transportation again? So public transportation agencies are on one side uh, dealing with the, the pandemic and reassuring customers they're taking actions to make traveling by transit uh, uh, safe. And so they are disinfecting very regularly. They have very, very good protocols now for both uh, uh, keeping people safe in terms of use of this proper disinfectants on board, social distancing in the stations, uh, reduced capacity on board the vehicles. Also protecting the, uh, those that work for the agencies. And so making sure there is separation from the drivers, which are exposed actually uh, to, to a lot of customers getting in and out of a bus uh, and uh, the passengers. At the same time, there is another uh, risk for public agency. So they need to promote ridership. They need to promote the service and making people understand that it, is, it can be safe. But at the same time, there is a funding issue especially here in the US where uh, many public transportation are, the ridership is very low still, uh, funding is becoming a big issue. Uh, ridership is low, the revenue stream uh, is uh, absolutely very, very low. And this is causing actually a funding crash uh, that, that, that could be actually a big problem for the future. Also because it happens at a time in which many state and regional agencies that usually provide funding for public transportation are already dealing a reduction in their budget. And so they have limited ability to support public transportation. So pretty uh, dire warning as far as public transportation goes. I mean, if uh, you can't get the public's confidence that it's safe to ride, this could be a very bad thing for the foreseeable future. I would not be surprised if we see a reduction in the service. Many public transportation agencies might actually reduce the number of rides they provide. They might actually uh, compress their schedule, reducing the frequency that they provide the service. Um, from a societal perspective, we also need to think like, you know, outside public transportation, what else we can do? Uh, because a lot of people might be in inducing using their cars. But first of all, there's an equity consideration. Some people might not own a car or it might be too expensive to travel by car. Then there is the environmental component. And then there is also the uh, livability of cities that we need to consider and the health issues. So already, already some cities are actually been promoting uh, active travel as a potential solution to increase like, you know, non-car trips. And that I think is something we should try to promote more and more in our society. Already many cities are trying to convert some parking space into bike lanes, uh, more, uh, walkable, uh, friendly environment. And that could be a potential solution to compensate at least a crisis that I think will last for some time for public transportation. And this whole transportation issue has, um, you know, huge implications for the economy because major cities like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, San Francisco that, you know, are, are densely populated, they rely, they almost can't operate without being able to move vast quantities of people distances. So this could actually have very far reaching implications. Absolutely. Transportation is vital to cities, especially the, the big cities in America, they need uh, to rely on public transportation. It's pretty much impossible to move everybody by car, simply because there is no physical space for too many cars on the roads. There's also a question of how the cities will evolve in the near future. And a lot of this depends on how long the pandemic will last and what really will be the ability of the country to recover from it uh, in a shorter versus longer time. Uh, we're already seeing that uh, many companies are encouraging uh, remote working, also in the medium term. So not only right now in this weekend we talk, as we're talking, but for instance, a lot of the high tech industry is already forecasting that they will encourage smart working and remote working during 2021. That's a question also uh, on the land use. Uh, will people uh, still live close to their jobs uh, if they know that at least for the next year or so, they might actually rely on telecommuting? And the new hires, will there need be space, need for like, you know, more office space 
when companies hire new workers uh, if many of them will work from home. So I'm not saying that companies will downsize their offices, but it is possible that we use the office space in a little bit more dense configuration. So the square footage per employee might actually change because they simply might not grow office space at the same speed in which they grow the workforce. And then in the longer term, there's also a question, if more and more companies rely on remote working, they might actually uh, allow substitution of jobs uh, in long distance. If somebody gets a job uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area for one of the tech companies, but is based in Texas or Georgia or uh, uh, Minnesota or India, do they need to physically relocate to the Bay Area? They might actually stay there. And it could be potentially also a, a way for companies to actually hire people in lower uh, paying jobs uh, in uh, uh, low labor cost uh, countries like uh, 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 there's been already a relocation of a lot of activities we could see more and more relocation of traditionally jobs which are higher paying and they usually were still in the US but now could be more mobile because we are breaking the physical distance uh, and there's no need to be in a short commuting distance from their jobs. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is we don't know a lot uh, of how things will evolve yet because it really depends on the length and the timing with which we will deal and we will put the pandemic under control. All right. We are, we are taking audience questions. So if you're watching us live, you just leave them in the comment section and we will work in as many as we can. Michael, I'd like to turn to you. I, I think we've lost your uh, video, but we still have you on the line. Um, you're coming at this from a different approach, looking at mobile phone data. How does that tell you uh, about people's travel behavior? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it appears that everyone in my neighborhood is uh, working remotely this morning or tele teleworking, so the internet's a little spotty, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the data that we worked with is anonymized mobile phone data uh, that is available at some geographic scale, like a, a census tract or, or maybe a county level. So it gives us a picture of overall mobility and aggregate um, at the community level. Um, and it includes measures like uh, what share of people uh, appear to be staying completely at home um, as given by a proxy of following where their mobile devices go. Um, and so we can see really interesting and, and stark patterns of how that's changed overall as we've moved from uh, the pre-pandemic period into now this, this area of social distancing, and then also how that response differs by uh, different groups of people or different sort of demographic uh, characteristics of communities. So, so when you're actually looking at this data, are you looking at... Um kind of uh, density of cell phones that are active at a moment? Are you actually kind of, are you able to trace the movement of an actual individual phone that's anonymized, but can you actually tra trace where the, how the path is going of an individual phone? No, so we don't have access to that level of specificity. It's uh, these data aggregation companies that uh, obtain the mobile phone data and then aggregate it up to at least the census tract level which is about 5,000 people, which is about the, the lowest uh, or the smallest community level that that, that kind of data is, is being made uh, available for researchers. So, so what did you see change from before the pandemic? You know, before the pandemic, there was a certain kind of maybe a pattern of movement uh, and, and now after the pandemic or during the pandemic, what were the changes that you've been seeing? Yeah, so there's a whole host of different uh, measures of how to parse the mobility uh, data. But one good example is that completely at home measure that I mentioned, which just gives the, the share of individuals as given by their devices that are staying completely at home within uh, say 150 uh, meters of their, of their home base where they stay overnight. And before the pandemic, uh, there was some variation o over space and over different communities, but it was about maybe 25% of of individuals look like they were uh, staying home. Um, and then after, uh, let's say, the middle of March, as we transitioned into April and later on, that jumped from about the low 20 percentage uh, point level to around 40% uh, staying completely at home. And then unpacking that aggregate outcome, uh, we see that before the pandemic arrived, wealthier communities uh, were the most mobile, uh, that is staying home the least. And then after that pandemic, you actually see a, a total switch in, in that pattern where they uh, are then able to stay home the most. 
So to put some numbers to that, those wealthier, the top 20% uh, highest income earning communities in the United States, they jumped from about 20% up to 45% staying at home. So a 25 percentage point jump, whereas the poorest communities only made a 10 percentage point jump. So it really gives you kind of an insight into, you know, income inequality or, you know, disparities with who can stay home and who can't. Yeah, for sure. So our study didn't get deeply into the mechanisms that drive this, but there are several that, that are, are pretty obvious to us. Uh, and it has, to, it has a lot to do with the nature of work. And then it also has a lot to do with the nature of how we meet our basic needs, like, like getting groceries and, and so on. Right. We have a question from a, a viewer, Craig, who's watching on Facebook asks, how will COVID-19 impact high-speed rail? This one might that's be for good, you, Giovanni, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, High-speed rail is already having a troubled history in the US. Uh, in California, as many people in the audience uh, are probably aware of, uh, high-speed rail is delayed, but also it's underfunded. And so there's been a, like a big problem because the project actually is costing much more than where the initial estimates uh, and is taking a lot of time to be built. So I'm actually not sure really when it will be in operation, at least when we think about uh, the entire line going from Northern California to Southern California. It seems there is a clear timeline for the opening of that initial stretch, which is in the Central Valley of California. But then like, you know, the, the most difficult part, which are like, you know, the penetration in the corridor into the Silicon Valley and the San Francisco uh, Peninsula and in LA will take a longer time and long, much bigger investments uh, and it's actually uh, a little bit more difficult uh, to complete. Uh, if we look at uh, Europe, what is happening, uh, railways are actually having uh, uh, somehow some troubles, but also they are seeing like, you know, some more support from the government. And that is actually very important when we think about like, you know, an important infrastructure like high-speed rail. Um, I will cite uh, several countries of Europe where uh, high-speed rail has been operating at a very, very limited capacity because uh, pretty much there was the need to reduce the number of people on board to reduce the potential spread of the virus. But at the same time, uh, the services continue to operate in these months and it's actually recovering now. But also many governments, uh, as they uh, organize their stimulus packages and support to the economy, they are actually uh, increasing their investments in high-speed rail as a solution for long-term developments of their countries. And we're seeing this in Spain, in France, in Italy, in Germany, in a lot of countries. So continued support from the government uh, is important, in particular at the time in which the short-term revenues are declining and the costs are actually staying high because pretty much uh, the uh, high-speed rail companies need to operate uh, at a reduced capacity. In the US, uh, uh, for now, like you know, the, the plan for operation of high-speed rail is to open at a time that we hope it will be uh, way after like you know this uh, pandemic is over but the big question is uh, will the pandemic leave uh, a long lasting impact on the funding available for high speed rail and on the way people travel uh, potentially high speed rail actually could capitalize from the fact that the air transport seems to be downsizing a little bit uh, all estimates, even from the International Association of the Airlines, uh, say that it will take three, four years to go back to the volume before the pandemic. And uh, a lot of airlines are reducing their fleets, they're scaling down their volume. So potentially, high-speed rail could arrive at a time in which air travel somehow accounts for a smaller percentage of travel and a smaller, lower volume. And at the time in which... Uh, uh, all travel is increasing, more services could be provided also with rail, so somehow could benefit from that recovery. But that assumes there will be continuing investments in the infrastructure, even at the time in which we expect the state and federal budgets to be actually in trouble in the next few years. Well, do you think, I guess, do either of you think that there might be lasting effects on people's travel habits? Because I guess, you know, the industry won't uh, you know, ramp back up unless there's demand, most likely, right? So do you think that people will actually, you know, go back to what they were doing before? Or has this been such a break from the way we've been operating all this time that, you know, maybe people will end up staying, you know, working more at home anyway? 
there will certainly be some long long term effects. Uh, I'm actually interested to see what uh, Michael uh, uh, is finding in his research. In our work, we really like you know a lot of our work right now is really trying to focus on distinguishing what is temporary from what are the long term impacts. And this is not only on the demand side of how people behave, but also on the supply side of transportation. Uh, already during the pandemic, we've been seeing that uh, some companies are going into a process of mergers and acquisition. And this will actually affect the availability of services in the future. I'll give you an example. We live in Davis, uh, and in Davis, uh, uh, students and faculty members and all the residents of Davis were used to the red bikes uh, from Jump, from the bike sharing. And Jump was a division of uh, Uber, but actually Uber during the pandemic has decided to shut down entirely the Jump division, and they're actually merging it with a competitor, Lime. So we will have a bigger micromobility operator operating bikes and scooters, but actually, the less competition there is in the market and the more mergers, the more likelihood that we might have a different fare structures, different availability of services and so on. And that inevitably affects demand. And similar things could happen in all markets. Uh, car, uh, rental car industry will be affected. Potentially, we could see more mergers in the car industry, car manufacturers, investments in new technologies, and also air travel. We could see more bankruptcies, more mergers, also in that sector, which inevitably will affect the future patterns in the services that are available and how people buy them, depending on price and availability. Yeah, I think the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, because um, we are certainly creatures of habit, uh, and we're developing some strong new habits in this, this new era over the past few months. Um, but then from the other side, we also know that our capacity to maintain social distancing over time is, is just limited. And we see the strongest response when there's an initial call for social distancing. And then we see that the strength of that response tend to decay over time. And this is nothing new. So we, we've looked at this uh, to the best we could in the past. So, for example, with the uh, swine flu outbreak in 2009, that originated out of uh, around the area of Mexico City. We didn't have access to the same kind of mobile device data uh, back in that era. And so we, we looked for the next best alternative uh, at the time, which was uh, TV watching data, which was nicely consistently gathered before, during, and after. And it was also differentiated by the socioeconomic level of, of the different individual households. So we could get very fine scaled day-to-day sense of how people were responding, for example, staying, staying at home more and presumably then watching more television. And we saw something very similar where uh, once social distancing measures were called for, you saw this, this strong initial response that started to then taper off after a matter of a week or two. Uh, and then we also saw that it was strongly differentiated by, by socioeconomic level where the highest socioeconomic levels were able to have a, a stronger response and maintain it for longer. Um, so I, I think we see both things. I think we'll see changing habits, but then also uh, an increasing um, reluctance to say as socially distanced as we've been asked to in the, in the past. And while there is a lot of uncertainty in these topics, uh, I think we can already predict a few things. So for instance, one of these is uh, e-shopping has increased a lot during the pandemic, but e-shopping is also here to stay. We don't expect really this to go back uh, uh, to pre-pandemic levels uh, simply because it was already a trend that was happening in society that the pandemic has uh, contributed to increase. And also it has expanded the base uh, of users because in the past, uh, uh, e-shoppers were mainly people that were more educated, urban residents, uh, younger people. But what we see now is that a lot of people that were traditionally not using e-shopping in the past, uh, elderly, uh, people that are not very familiar with technology are now starting to shop online. And once they have made that step and the friction of doing the first shop online, the first activity uh, has started, that probably will become part of their routine and their habits. Another thing will be the impacts on the retail industry. The retail industry was already suffering before the pandemic. Now, with the big uh, uh, sufferance uh, during the pandemic and the reduced sales and the competition of e-shopping, it's likely that some shops will close. 
And unfortunately, and I say I'm very sad about this because I'm a big supporter of seeing downtowns which are full of life and people walking around and shopping locally. Unfortunately, some of the shops will never reopen simply because the business model will not really be successful that much anymore. And so these are impacts that probably will continue in the long term. Mm. For the telecommuting and remote working, I, I think like uh, uh, I, I agree with Michael, uh, people are tired of the social distancing, so probably they will go back uh, to more physical activities and to commute back to work. But also like, you know, they might continue to do it at a lower uh, level. So right now we telecommute every day of the week and maybe in the future, many uh, now that are really familiar and it's socially acceptable to work from home, they might continue to do it once or twice a week. So somehow it could have uh, an impact. Uh, in the past, uh, the studies have shown that telecommuting, there were big expectations of an its, its impact uh, to reduce uh, traffic congestion 20, 30 years ago. And this never realized. Telecommuting has always remained a marginal, tiny portion of the population and not having a big impact in reducing traffic uh, in our society. Today, this might be a game changer. And uh, uh, disruptions uh, might leave a long lasting impact. And it usually the longer the disruption, the more likely that some long-term impacts might remain. Right. We have another viewer question. Carlos, who's watching on Facebook asks, you've mentioned a few times uh, that the use of public transportation may struggle with public confidence in its safety. What types of best practices or policies have you seen that have been most effective for both public health, but also in ensuring public confidence or what would you recommend? I I think it's difficult to say what really can drive public confidence because right now what we are is a situation in which many people don't have a lot of trust in the authorities, also because of a lot of the conflicting messages that have been put out. And this also creates some confusion in some users. Uh, some of them think the mask is good, the mask is bad, uh, social distancing is really needed or not, or we can get the virus more likely touching a surface of being next to a person. And so that creates some confusion. So having more clear messages about uh, what is really a high risk activity and what could be actually a relatively low risk activity could be very important, uh, even more than doing all the things that public agencies are already doing because they're already trying to minimize the risk. And also let me say that for a lot of public op transit operators, ridership is so low that the risk is actually very low because we're not talking about riding in a crowded subway or bus, but in a lot of cases, riding with very few other passengers and that helps actually reduce the risk. What, what can your research tell us about who's most affected by the pandemic? I guess we've talked a little bit about wealth disparities. Um, are there any other uh, clues that you, how you can kind of dis distinguish the disparities? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the equity, I think, is a big issue. M Michael touched on this topic of the disparity. I, I want to add, uh, our survey data show that uh, not only there is a, a, an impact in the way people travel, but also in the way they've been affecting their job activities. If we look at the number of people that were employed before the pandemic, and then we look at those that have lost a job, we see that a lot of people in the lower income categories in the minority groups are more likely to have lost their job. And interestingly, in the higher income categories and the more white population, we see a larger proportion of uh, people that even if they're not temporarily working, they're still paid by their companies. But in the lower income groups and the minority groups, we see a higher likelihood that the people that have been left at home, they are actually left without pay, which is clearly like, you know, somehow increasing even more the equity gap, because a lot of times these groups already start from financial positions, which are weaker and they have less savings to actually deal with the, uh, the impacts of these issues. And then, like, you know, the other question is uh, our survey data has shown that a lot of people that have reduced using public transportation some of them are switching to cars. And so it was actually interesting to see that about more than a third of the people that we have been tracking and they've been using public transportation less this year compared to the past two years, about more than a third of them are actually reporting more trips by car. So somehow there is a compensation effect, which is scary for the environment, but it's also an equity issue because a lot of public transportation users, they cannot make that change. So that model shift is only possible for those that have access to car, while other groups might either not have access to car or actually might have uh, 
financial difficulties for whom, even if they own a car, traveling to the downtown, paying for gas, parking costs might actually be uh, really affecting them in a dispropor disproportionate way. Michael? Yeah, I think it's, it's really clear that uh, Black communities and Latinx communities have borne an excessive uh, share of the brunt of the pandemic, um, both in terms of the cases per capita uh, and especially in terms of the deaths per capita. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really difficult question to, to unpack because there's, there's some overlap with issues of income. Uh, there's overlap with issues of pre-existing conditions. Um, and, it, and it's really sort of tough to, to, in real time, try to disentangle all of these overlapping factors. Um, like you can find, you can easily and quickly find lots of different interesting correlations, but trying to get under the hood and unpack whether it's really pre-existing conditions or whether it's really access to quality health care or whether it's, um, you, you know, an ability to socially distance, uh, all of those things, it, 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 it's, it's going to take quite some time for researchers to carefully unpack amongst those correlated uh, drivers, which are really the ones that were, were key in, in driving those disparate outcomes. But I think what is clear is, is we need public policy that, that focuses on those communities. So there's no mystery right now that, that they're bearing a disproportionate share of the brunt of the pandemic. And that goes all along the chain from helping them to avoid uh, transmission of the virus and, and uh, providing uh, or at least ensuring access to things like masks um, and help you know, in social distancing and, and sanitation and, and public transportation. But then also... Uh, thinking further down the line, um, you, you know, our, our hope to get out of this, uh, this, this sort of hole that we're in is the arrival of a vaccine, uh, maybe later on in, in 2020 or uh, presumably sometime during 2021. And these, this understanding of the disproportionate impact, uh, I believe, should really feature strongly in how we think about allocating those vaccines. So we know right now the, the CDC is, is engaging expert committees to try to develop um, some insights into how those vaccines should be allocated, looking at different demographic groups that, that differ in terms of their level of, of, of pre-existing conditions and risk and, and their work status and their income status. Um, so we're starting to do some of that work to, to, uh, to try to analyze that question, get a sense of you know, when this vaccine comes out, and it is very scarce, presumably, for the first six months, nine months, maybe a year even, if we have this scarce thing that we have to figure out where do we prioritize, uh, that'll be a, a really important decision. And I think these disparities should, should play a large factor in that conversation. We have a uh, relate, kind of a related question from a, a viewer. Andy, who's watching on Facebook asks, what are some long-term policies that could allow lower income people to work from home more easily and to not be left behind by changes in transportation? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I think if you look at the, uh, the there's data available on the types of jobs that um, are, are typical at different levels of income. And it, and it just turns out to be the case that, that some of those jobs that are typical at the lower end of the income earning spectrum are the ones that are that demand physical presence. Um, they, it's just a, a difficult fact of life. Um, so I'm not sure if if a whole lot can be done there. I think in terms of flexibility at the moment, like in the immediate sense right now, we, we've seen the, um, the uh, unemployment insurance offered by the, by the federal government lapse, uh, the additional bump that, that they had been providing lapse. And what really frightens me about that is that that's gonna drive presumably a lot of, of folks who are the most stressed out right now to have to go out and just take whatever they can get. Um, and, and, and really lower the priority that's put on the level of risk that that job uh, might present to them. Um, so that, that's really, an, I think, an immediate need at the moment is, is to do something to restore at least some of that support uh, so that we don't have people forced into making really terrible decisions for their, their own health and their family's health. I agree. It's difficult sometimes to develop policies uh, to really address this problem in terms of like, you know, solving the inability to work remotely for many type of jobs, uh, simply because if somebody is required to be in a Starbucks uh, in, in there or in a restaurant or many other jobs in the service industry or in the retail industry, it's really like, you know, impossible to uh, promote uh, telecommuting or 
provide alternatives. And neither we can think that the entire economy reconverts into like, you know, uh, IT jobs that can be done remotely from home. And so I think it's very important when we look at the policies to really target policies to help and support those that are suffering the most. Uh, I personally was a little bit skeptical, uh, for instance, about the checks that were mailed to a lot of uh, uh, individuals in the country, simply because they were given to a lot of uh, users. They don't really need it. A lot of individuals that are working at home receiving $1,200 while on top of their salary, where they are comfortably working from home and they can still continue their activity. It uh, might be good for the economy. You support consumption because those people might spend that money in the, in the economy, but it's actually probably not the best way to allocate the money. So I really hope like, you know, that moving forward, uh, any uh, uh, support for the population is really more targeted to those that are suffering the most because either they lost their job or they have reduced the number of hours they work. Because many times we talk only about those that have permanently lost their job, but the reality is that we have a lot of other people that have reduced the number of hours they work, and for hourly workers that have reduction, net reduction in salary. For self-employed people, a reduction in revenues, that can be a big problem. And so we try to target the policies that have been suffering the most, uh, rather than just uh, supporting the entire population, including those that have been affected the least. Uh, Craig, and just to please. add... Oh, please add, yes. Oh, and, and sorry, just to to add briefly that I think if, if we're thinking about what we can do in that in that labor setting, uh, the work setting to help those workers, it probably is less focused on helping them figure out ways to telecommute, give it something that's a tough thing to do, but rather uh, ensure that they have um, either through work or independently from work, uh, reliable health insurance and reliable health care and also uh, the, the, the paid sick leave when they need it. Those are probably the 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 issues with the, the labor market or the job market that, that would go the furthest to, to help them in that kind of situation. I will add another topic. We are in a university and a lot of us are doing research on these topics and our research has impact. So we connect with policy, uh, we connect with agencies that are actually developing ways to in intervene in the society and support the population. So it's very important to think also about what data do we have? Because many times I hear a lot of colleagues also in the transportation community thinking that we have data that is from a representative sample of the community, that we have data that have been weighted to correct for non-representativeness of the population. In reality, the, we need to think very carefully because a lot of these users that are suffering the most, I'm talking about minorities, low-income workers, a lot of people that are really struggling right now, they sometimes don't have a smartphone, they might not have a cell phone at all, or they have an old feature phone that doesn't have a GPS tracking, so they're not in the data that Michael uses. They're not answering to our surveys, so they're not part of the data that I use. So sometimes it's a really a problem, and just looking at some observed categories, like you know income, the fact that we have some low-income respondents in our data, whether it's smartphone data or survey data, doesn't necessarily need mean that we have data about those that have been most affected. A lot of those people that are actually right now uh, increasingly relying on food banks or that are out of the job market or they're losing their home, many times they're not represented at all in our data. And there is no waiting that can solve that problem. If somebody's not in our data set, we cannot really say anything on that. So it's something very important to consider. And I think it's a big call for all colleagues working in research on these topics. We need to think carefully about that. Okay, we're going to need to wrap up in a few minutes, but I do want to hit a couple more questions. Um, Craig on Facebook asks, do you think more walkable communities will gain popularity? For example, affordable housing within walking distance of basic services like grocery stores and entertainment, as well as public transportation. Briefly, what do you think? It could. It all depends on whether people feel the environment is a welcoming to walk and it's something uh, uh, that they really want to embrace. Uh, I hope so. It, it really depends on the coordination also of efforts from the local communities and planning agencies to provide something that uh, it's uh, welcoming to people. Nobody wants to walk next to a busy street with a lot of cars uh, somewhere that is perceived as uh, unsafe. But I see some positive signals in many cities. So I really hope we can move more towards that direction. And I think in the short run, you might see almost the opposite, where uh, people are moving out of some of these walkable cities that are, that are very expensive to live in 
knowing that for the moment, they don't have to worry about a, a longer commute if they move out to more affordable places, maybe with more natural amenities or other kinds mm-hmm. of amenities. Um, so I think walkable is always going to be great, but uh, people are going to balance that against the trade-off of how expensive it is uh, to live in places. And especially if telecommuting continues to be a feature of the future work environment, then less of an emphasis on avoiding those kind of costly commutes. And I guess just to wrap up, do you, do you think there's a, a need for policy changes that would get people out of their cars again once this whole pandemic is over to kind of encourage, you know, maybe using public transportation, maybe living closer to where you work? Absolutely. I, yeah. There, there is a strong need for these policies. We're actually working with agencies like the California Air Resources Board that is really interested in understanding ways to decarbonize transportation and in the post-COVID world to really understand how we can promote the things which are more environmental friendly, that are non-car dependent and so on. I also would say that given also that there is a risk for some increased car dependence in the near future, this also strikes even more the importance of electrification. So if people are staying in cars, better that there are electric vehicles, better that there are zero emission vehicles rather than the traditional internal combustion engines. This doesn't solve all problems, of course, we will still have congestion and other environmental issues, but at least the increased electrification could resolve at least part of the greenhouse gas emission. Then we need also to promote like, you know, a return to transit, a more walkable, more bike, and share mobility could be part of that too, to promote like, you know, scooters, bikes, and so on. I do think briefly that there will be this window when we feel like we're going to transition out of this need to shelter in place when we can and socially distance, when hopefully a vaccine has helped to get us over to the other side of that. There'll be a window in which we're relaxing and changing our behavior in all sorts of ways to to sort of adjust back. So I think taking advantage of that elasticity window, whatever you want to call it, like when we're more flexible uh, in our behaviors, we kind of adjust back to a more open world. Uh, that is probably going to be critical to try to think ahead and have those programs and initiatives ready mm-hmm. to catch people as they're uh, sort of re, uh, readjusting their behavior before they sort of lock into new, new long run patterns. All right. Well, you know, this has been really interesting, really great. Um, you know, and as the pandemic continues, I'm sure you'll be continuing to keep an eye on how it's affecting how much we travel and, and how we do it. So thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your work. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Sidarius. Giovanni Tiercella is director of the Three Revolutions Future Mobility Program at the UC Davis Institute for Transportation Studies. He's also a senior research engineer at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And Michael Springborn is an environmental economist and associate professor in the UC Davis Department of Environmental Science and Policy. On the next UC Davis Live COVID-19, we'll be looking into the latest on what we know about COVID-19 in pets and what we're learning about how a different coronavirus in cats could help us treat people with COVID-19. Until next time, I'm Satirius Johnson, and this is UC Davis Live COVID-19.